Hi again, I don't know if anyone can see me. Hopefully this is working right now. Fingers crossed, who knows? It's so weird, because I tried this like literally yesterday, I was all by myself and I did a test and I was like, can anybody see me? And everyone's like, it's working, it's great, you're here. And I was, I had nothing to say, I was just doing a test. Oh yes, it works. Awesome. All right. So if you are watching on YouTube, then I left a link in the description for the slides. If you're here on Crowdcast, the link for the slides are below. You can download those and print those out. And just so you know, there are two sets of chats going on on each side. So I am going to go ahead. We are going to review the mystery, how to, no, writing and selling your mystery novel with Hallie Efron. So it's not cozy mystery specific. And just so you know, um, I did kind of skip over things that were two things. One, things that were like outdated, like, you know, carry a tape recorder with you. So, you know, when she wrote this at the time, I don't think recording things on your phone was like a big thing. And then also um, there were some links that were like finding agents. I think it's hard because those things are expired like as soon as you hit publish. Um, so a lot of those had just been out of business for like a decade or something. So we'll skip over that, but I'll make a little note for you on where that is. All right, so I am going to share my screen. Hopefully you can see my slides in front of you. And if not, hopefully you have them. Remember, I always share my slides with everybody. I know some people are weird about that, but honestly, like I can't really learn unless I can look at the slides too and have things to write down. Um, I don't know what they call that, a kinesthetic learner or something like that. I know there's different terms for that. But basically um, what we have here, let's see, can you see the whole slide? Okay. I know it's a little hard because it's Keynote, um, so it's not PowerPoint, so it doesn't like take over the whole screen. Uh, so you kind of see stuff on the left. But here's the agenda for today. So who is Hallie Efron? Um, she's a mystery writer. She's actually the sister, in case you're wondering, to the famous Nora Efron. So Nora Efron was the screenwriter who wrote When Harry Met Sally, Silkwood, Sleepless in Seattle's, you know, those romantic comedies. I mean, Silkwood wasn't a romantic comedy, but the rest were. Uh, so basically I've broken this down into four sections, which correspond with the four sections in the book. And the first is planning, the second is writing, the third is revising, and the fourth is selling. So I put one slide per chapter, or sometimes a couple of them were long, so some of them are multiple slides. But what I did in for this is if anything was generic, like how to write dialogue, like that to me is you can learn that anywhere. And so I kind of skipped over that. Same thing with, um, you know, how to edit, unless it was mystery specific, I really didn't make too much of a note about it. Also like point of view to me, who cares? Um, so I just skipped over that really quickly. So also I'll talk about how I'm using this book and then other resources for a mystery course in case you're wondering. So who is Hallie Efron? Kind of did that really quick. She actually travels. I don't know if you guys know this. If you look at her website, she is like a conference traveling like fiend. She is always out and about going to places, speaking. She sometimes gives those uh, half day seminars that they have through Mystery Writers of America, which I don't know if anyone has joined that group, but I found I don't want to say zero value in there, but basically they just do these half day workshops. They're very random. They never publicize it. You might find out the schedule just on accident if they um, just someone accidentally posts the schedule to a website. But otherwise, I have no idea whatever they do. Um, but she does teach. In fact, I didn't think it's a one day. I think it's like a half day workshop if it happens to come to your town. Um, but she does speak at a ton of different conferences, mystery conferences, just com writing conferences in general, um, in case you'd like to like hang out with her more or get more information directly from her. So book summary, um, this is the planning part. So this part, section I actually found a lot of value in because it was very mystery specific. Um, and this here, I just put quotes that if it was applicable or it was interesting, I just added it here to the slide. But basically all the slides are set up like this. It has a quote at the top, some of my notes here in the middle. And then over here at the very bottom is just the major takeaway in case you're like, I don't have time even to look at these slide notes. I just wanna know the main takeaway for each chapter. So that is there at the bottom. But 
for the premise, um, basically she was doing a lot of the, I want to say Captain Obvious stuff, like do people watching, eavesdrop on conversations and, you know, read magazine and news articles. And as for me, I have a hundred percent never done that for any story idea. So if you don't like doing that, don't worry about that either. I actually get all of my ideas from IMDb, um, but this is not about me, this is about this book, so let's go on. Um, but she's saying to carry a notebook and pen and you know, carry a tape recorder, um, which obviously you know what this means, just carry it around, carry, carry your phone and just record things when you think of them if you don't feel like writing it. So the next chapter is talking about your sleuth and this is not cozy mystery specific. So she talked about hard boiled detectives and if you're going to do that route, make sure that they're unattached and they have no kids, right? So that they that makes them like harder and tougher. And so they can like pick up and go at any moment. Otherwise, it's just like if your your detective has a pet, people are subconsciously worried. Like if they just take off and leave, like who's going to watch um, little Snoopy or uh, who's going to take care of little Susie while you're gone, right? So you can't just kind of go. Um, but usually if you use that, they have a dark and tortured past and they, everything, this is like, I think the most important thing is your sleuth needs a reason to investigate, right? So it's, I mean, as a reader to me, it's always frustrating to be like, and I just had to know, why would you just have to know? You have like a day job, you have a husband, you have children, you have other things going on in your life. Why are you wasting time investigating this random murder, right? So the, this is like, I think the best advice, like the, they need to have something where, you know, they need to help prove that the police are wrong or the police are corrupt or someone close to them or maybe themselves are a suspect. So something else other than just they wanted to start investigating for the fun of it. Uh, chapter three, the crime and victims secrets. So everybody has secrets and the more secrets that you can give to your characters, the better it is, even the victim who is dead. And so some of these end up being red herrings, but try to think of those in the beginning uh, and how they could or could not lead to, um, you know, dead ends within the investigation, because that's also part of the fun of everything and start the crime and so again the crime should just like she was saying before everything should link together don't just make it a random thing the only time it's random i think is if you have a uh police procedural on tv where you know they just a case comes through and they need to solve it a case comes through and they need to solve it but in general everything is connected for a reason or haven't you ever noticed sometimes when they have subplots you know they end up circling back and relating or telling a moral lesson for the crime at hand. So chapter four, the villain. Um, so this was a little tangent where she went off on pantsers versus plotters. And, you know, the pantsers always say that, you know, they like it to be a surprise for them. So that's why they don't do any pre-planning. Um, but she was saying that, you know, most plotters save time because they don't have to rewrite everything like pantsers do, especially with the mystery, because it is so intricate and it's more like a puzzle and it's more like chess versus checkers. So if you were ever going to maybe try to plot, mysteries might be the place to do it. Uh, and, you know, same thing that you hear all the time, I feel like, and no matter what genre it is, whoever your villain is, they shouldn't be just one dimensional, just evil for the sake of being evil. That's usually horror movies, right? Like Attack of the Killer Spiders or something like that. Like they don't really need a deep motivational reason to do bad things. Uh, but in your book, in your mystery, they should be uh, justified in why they're doing stuff. Maybe they don't think that, that they're the bad guy. And also they should be kind of clever and at worst case, at least as clever as your sleuth. So they keep them on their toes and it makes it a little more interesting. She's also put some different reasons down here, which are the most common on why people murder or commit a crime. Uh, so the takeaway is just to make sure you create a really good villain. Um, so same thing over here. Oh, so this was just saying to match the tone, right? So if your villain is going to kill somebody with some super, 
uh, sonic, I don't even know, like sound bomb or something, then they should probably be a technical uh, engineer of some sort versus maybe they know nothing and they just tried to look it up on the internet. So whatever way or manner in which the victim was killed that the obviously the villain did, murderer did it, then it should match that person's skill set or knowledge. It shouldn't be like a total surprise. Again, it, we'll talk about this later, but she also says like, everything shouldn't be like, uh, I would have never figured that out kind of thing. You should help give the reader some clues along the way. Um, and same thing with the level of violence. And obviously with cozy mysteries, there's like no violence, but here she's saying, you know, depending on what kind of mystery you're writing, if you are going to have a super violent crime where like they hate this person so much that they wanna to torture them in the way that they die, then it should match with whatever wrong or anger that they're feeling towards that particular person. Chapter five, innocent suspects. So you should have no more than five and at least two potential suspects, including the actual murderer. So anything more than that gets way too confusing. And um, I read a mystery book recently. I was just so overwhelmed. I think there was like, and it wasn't a bad book, but they were just trying to introduce too many characters. And there were 40, I want to say 40 characters introduced in the first three chapters. So I almost put the book down. Um, I had to make notes for it. And remember, the mysteries should be enjoyable. And so that's why you don't want to introduce too many characters, including suspects. Um, so the suspects, just like we mentioned before, they should all have secrets as well as your victim um, and the witnesses. And you should make them look um, make them look guilty, even if they're innocent. So if you've ever watched any police procedural on TV or a movie or read a book, then you know that it seems like this person is really going to be the killer, but it turns out they're totally innocent or they had a good alibi or something like that. Also, um, maybe they are ways to make them look guilty. She has a really great list here on different things that you can do. I won't go through all of them um, because you have the slides, but you know, things that are in their past, like their secrets, or maybe they lied, like they seem like super nice. Like maybe someone says, oh, I'm a vegan. I would never ever harm animals. But then you see them later enjoying a steak, right? So uh, that was the crack in the veneer one because that one sounded a little odd to me. So I thought I'd explain that one. Um, but the suspect profile should include a motive, a lie, and a secret. I thought this was really key. So no matter what, every single one of those suspects, and remember you only have three to five, um, each of them ha should have a reason that they wanted the person dead. They should have a lie that they are telling and also something secret that they are hiding. Um, chapter six, supporting cast. So this was where I was talking to just don't do too many people, but for a mystery, your sleuth needs to have a few basic people in place. And so she's done a really good job with using Sherlock Holmes as an example. So the sidekick is obviously Dr. Watson. And if you notice like an all sort of amateur sleuth shows, there's always a sidekick because otherwise it would just be the sleuth talking to themselves all the time, which would be incredible incredibly boring. So this is also acting as a soundboard. Um, usually the other person brings some sort of expertise that the uh, sleuth doesn't have, and they're usually total opposites. So you get some of that dynamic in sort of the dialogue and the banter, and they have different ideas or different ways to go about it than your sleuth. So your sidekick should never be a mini me of your sleuth, I guess is what I'm saying. And I know a lot of people have like besties that are their sidekick, but at least make that bestie like totally uh, different, right? So if one is super book smart, the other is more like a thief or criminal or someone who has like street smarts or something. Um, anyway, so Mrs. Hudson is also the person that cooks and cleans, so then you never have to worry about Sherlock Holmes going to the grocery store or looking up recipes or doing dishes because we already put a character in there to take care of that. Um, police information, a lot of times you'll see amateur sleuths have a significant other or love interest that is a police officer, detective. You don't have to do that. Um, you know, Sherlock Holmes didn't do that. A lot of other books don't do this. Again, this is a really, really old example. Um, uh, financial and strategic support. So a lot of times with Cozy Mysteries, people have jobs because solving crimes isn't their number one job unless obviously they are a detective or a PI. So in this case, Mycroft, his brother, provides all the money that he should ever, ever need. Um, so that is basically the point of your supporting cast 
for your sleuth. So um, there should also be an adversary. So usually someone kind of annoying, but not the villain, right? They're not evil. They're just kind of, they're more for comic relief, right? So in Murder, She Baked, and this is just my example of, you know, the meddling matchmaker mom. So Hannah is always trying to solve mysteries and run her bakery. And her mom's main goal is always to just pair Hannah up with some significant other so she can get her married and get grandchildren. So it stops her from doing the investigation. Um, it's her mom's worried about her safety and worried that it won't look attractive to other guys. So it's kind of like an adversary, advers adversarial just to her sleuthing and just her everyday life. Um, so these are all different possible sidekick roles that she had suggested uh, that these people take in your book. Um, chapter seven is setting. So this is, I think it was really actually a very good succinct chapter. You just need to think of three things. The when, you know, is it in the past? Is it present day? Um, where is it? The like the actual town or does it mostly take place in a hospital or in a different country? And then the context. So um, all of these. So if we go through when, obviously she said to, to think about the season, right? So if it's winter in Chicago, you have icy roads, you have like all these other roadblocks that could also act as adversaries to your investigation or enhance the crime or everybody inside of their um, exterior. So she was saying to do as much research as possible. I don't know how important that is. I, I know some people are like real sticklers and that will take them totally out of the book if something is totally wrong. Like if they say, you know, the Aurora Borealis lights were shining bright, but it's the wrong time of year. Maybe it's something like that. Um, so that was what she was saying about uh, exteriors and research. And then interiors. So she was really worried. Uh, there was a whole section too on like libel and getting sued. Uh, so I don't know if this was is a big issue or maybe was a bigger issue in the past, but I think this was a good rule of thumb. If you're going to poison somebody, don't use the name of a real restaurant, uh, use the name of a fake restaurant. Um, chapter eight, staking out the plot. So she was saying, think of different ways to make your sleuth miserable, because remember if he's happy and everything is perfect, then it's almost like a boring story, right? So there's other ways to kind of throw little jabs in there without like making the whole story about making your sleuth miserable. So, you know, injuries, right? Or sometimes people are addicted to pain pills or um, maybe they have a gambling addiction or, uh, you know, whatever happens though, like even if it's like a little thing, your sleuth should in theory come back even stronger after that setback. So you always still want to make sure your sleuth is the hero of the story. Um, but it does say to modulate it. So don't just make it every day something bad happens like Murphy's Law. Like some days they have bad days and then some days they have good days. So it should go up and down. Um, again, that has to do with pacing and everything else. Um, offering a dramatic opening. Uh, so she said to make sure you offer something exciting or unique, which is kind of like Captain Obvious advice. Don't we all want exciting and unique openings? Um, but basically she was saying, don't start out with something boring. Like I was looking at myself in the mirror and at my brown eyes and my red hair and my, right? So don't make it that like don't copy um, the most boring opening ever. Uh, and make sure no one likes a whiny hero. So your hero, no matter who they are, even if they're a down in their luck person, they should always see the glasses half full or see the rainbow after a, ra uh, after a rainstorm or something. So it shouldn't just be constant complaining. All right. Continuing with dramatic openings. Um, so she had an example in there of a dramatic opening of a baby left abandoned. I can't remember what book it was from. It was an actual book uh, that was left abandoned in front of a church. And so then it leaves the question of who left the baby. Uh, so that's one way or one example of how to create a dramatic opening. So plot twists. Uh, so she said to throw some plot twists in there, which wouldn't we all love to throw plot twists in there? But she had some good examples. So anything that where the witness is discredited that could really harm the investigation or new evidence that, you know, 
brings up a new suspect. So you don't have to, I think it's important to, you know, slowly introducing your characters, slowly introducing the suspects. You know, this could be an opportunity to, you know, bring up a suspect later or something that just credits a witness. So they're no longer reliable. And so all the information or conclusions you had drawn up to that point based on that witness are now gone. Um, some secret comes out, you know, the most famous one is the sleuth gets a threatening message because then we know that she's closer on the trail to actually figuring it out. This one's used a lot. Um, second murder, especially if it is the person that you think is your prime suspect gets murdered um, or the sleuth is attacked. So her main thing was these should be credible. So don't make them too far out and crazy. All right, chapter eight still, <laughs> um, the final climax. So what should it not include? So again, don't do anything unrealistic. Don't do anything where people are going to do like a double eye roll. Um, and then especially, and I've seen this a lot, don't do everything where at the end someone confesses everything just to confess it. And then all of a sudden you get all these details and all of the rationale that you really couldn't have figured out on your own beforehand. Um, and it all comes out in one big confession. Uh, and then also, I don't think anybody likes the and then I woke up plot. I think they did that with uh, what was that TV show Lost. And there was another TV show I really liked. It was one where he would blink back and forth between two different realities where I can't remember what it's called. I think it was called Awake, where in one reality, his wife and son died in the car accident. And then in the other reality, they didn't die and they both survived or something like that. And so, or the wife survived in one and the son survived in the other. And so then at the end of the se season, it just said, cause we were all trying to figure out like, why does he keep going through one reality to the other? He just woke up and he said it was all just a dream, <laughs> which I think annoyed everybody. Um, but the show was canceled anyway. So probably they didn't even care. Uh, and then again, the only, if only I'd known. So you can't withhold any information. She's going to repeat this over and over again in the book, which I think is good advice. Um, and then make sure that the climax doesn't take place off the stage where they're like, oh, where are you now? Oh, we're all done. We're all going out to dinner because we already caught the killer. He's been arrested. He's in jail and he's been sentenced to 10 years in prison. So, um, that's it. And also the coincidence ending. And subplots. So she has a suggestion over here for different subplots. You can do romance. Um, you know, like I said, the adversarial part for your sleuth could be their friends or their family. Uh, maybe they have health issues, remember an injury, or maybe they just had surgery or they're, they have an addiction. Um, their day job, again, if they are not a detective or PI. And a second totally, un, seems like it's completely unrelated investigation that ends up tying into the actual crime. There's a lot of TV shows that do this well. I think um, I'm right now rewatching Psych. I love that show. It's really funny. Anyways, have you noticed they'll do like sometimes they'll have a second investigation or something that comes up and it will be it, it'll seem like it's totally random, but it's related to the crime. The TV show Monk does this very well as well. And it's also possible I just watch too much TV. So um, the other subplot could be some unsolved event in the sleuth's life. Like, uh, you know, in Monk, it was his wife's murder that he was not able to solve. So her point was that you don't have to tie up all the subplots, especially if this is a series. It could be something that's just ongoing. Like in the TV show Monk, that went on for, I don't even know how many seasons that show was on, but six seasons until the very last two episodes, they finally solved the mystery history of his wife, but otherwise it kept going on and on as an ongoing thing. Um, all right, she's talking about titles and just be short and snappy, look at what other people are doing. And she had a really good uh, just reminder that titles can't be copyrighted. So even though you could use the title, The Da Vinci Code, that would seem a little cheesy and maybe you shouldn't do that. All right, how was that? We made it through part one. I know it's only 1230. I'm talking pretty fast because we have a lot of slides still. So we're now in part two, which is the writing, which I also found very valuable. So um, I think this will have a lot of great things for you. Hannah, yes, I was thinking of Monk when you're talking about tying in subplots. Yes, love that show. All right, so let's keep going. So chapter 10, writing a dramatic opening. So we did talk about this a little bit before, um, but she's saying, you know, go through the first sentence um, of tons of different books. I know every time I go, it's funny because whenever I read a book, I will be like, 
I'll read the first sentence and honestly, is it great? Is it exciting? Probably not, but I keep reading anyway. But, but when I go to write, I'm like, oh my God, the first sentence is so important. And really, I don't know if the first sentence is really that important because for the most part, people at that point are going to keep reading beyond the first sentence because they picked up your book and they're going to give it a chance. Um, there are some first sentences that are amazing where you're like, oh my gosh, I wish I had thought of that. Um, but my advice would be, yeah, it's great to have a great first sentence, but don't get hung up or waste like an entire week on it. I'll be honest, I have wasted entire weeks just going through Barnes and Noble and reading every single first sentence in every book um, until I found inspiration for just the right sentence. So don't do that. <laughs> um, the next one is she does say to just start right away in action. Uh, so, or start with an unanswered question like that one with the bait who left the baby in front of the church. Uh, but her most important advice is don't add backstory. Like this is the wrong place. And then she had a really, there was another author who had a great example of, you know, I turned in five page, five chapters of the story, which were all pretty much backstory. And the editor came back to me and told me to lose delete and lose all of the first five chapters. So most of the time you don't even need it or start with a crazy event. Um, and then she had this really good quote from Harlan Coben. I don't know if you've ever read him. I'm actually, um, I don't like that genre that much. Like I don't dislike it, but I don't like actively seek it out, but I really do like his books. They're actually really good. So it said, when my, when the first bullet hit my chest, I thought of my daughter. And so then right away, you're wondering like, does he survive? Does he not survive? Is this just a one chapter one off from this author? Are they going to time travel back to, you know, five weeks ago, which I actually hate when they do that. But um, so but either way, it starts in action and gets you in, like excited right away. Uh, chapter 11, introducing the sleuth. So same thing, no backstory. So what she said to do is make a list of 20 things about your sleuth that you think are interesting or important for the reader to know and then delete 15 of those and only keep the top five. Um, and then try to put that in there because obviously too much stuff will overwhelm them. They'll get bored and they probably won't even care. Uh, chapter 12, introduce major and minor characters. So the major characters versus the minors versus walk-ons. So walk-ons are like the bartender, uh, the attendant pumping gas, I don't even know if that's even a thing. Do people pump gas anymore for you? Um, so all of those people are nameless and they're just there to help add authenticity to your story. Like obviously you're going to be at a restaurant, you need a waitress um, or a bartender. And then, the, so the major characters all have opinions and they take action in the story that helps move the plot forward. The minor ones only appear one to two times. Uh, they're not really that important and you know, don't, worry about giving them a goal, motivation, conflict, or anything like that. Um, so she had some examples on how not to introduce characters. And she went through like uh, probably, I'm going to say like three or four different iterations of trying to introduce a character just to show you the craft behind how one is super boring and terrible. Um, you know, just like I said, anything that is surface details, like, you know, I looked in the mirror at my brown hair and my blue eyes, like, so, so boring, right? Um, so she said to put it in context. And if you are, so I write pretty much only first person POV, but if you're going to switch, you have to make sure as soon as a new character is introduced, whoever that particular chapter's POV is in, the reader should know right away what the relationship is between that new character and whoever the POV is, whether it's a stranger or whether it is their mother or it is the waitress or something else. Um, it's, everyone should always have some context right away. Um, and then same thing as she was saying before, and what I always say, don't introduce too many characters in the opening scene. People get overwhelmed and they put it down. And here's the other part about uh, the legal things that I was saying that she kind of went, she did a lot of detail on that I never even think of, um, but libel, so slander is the one where you actually talk and you say something bad about somebody. Libel is where it is written. Um, and she put down here the legal definition of libel and just said, oh, that's all I wrote, <laughs> and just said to make sure to be careful that you don't say anything bad about somebody that could be tied back to a real person, which I mean, I don't know, maybe you could. I feel like it's really hard, especially when it's in a work of fiction, um, but maybe not. 
I don't know. So chapter 13, dramatizing scenes and making chapters. So her tips for the scenes are start as late as possible. So don't start out if it's a morning scene, like I woke up, I brushed my teeth, I jumped in the shower, I toweled off, right? Like leave out all the boring stuff and just start right with the action as like as soon as you need to. Um, and then end it really early. So if you know you interviewed a suspect, don't after that be like, and then I went back to my car and I drove home, but then I noticed that I didn't have enough gas in the car. So I stopped at the gas station and I filled up and then I got some uh, some food for dinner because I didn't want to have to cook. And so all of that is boring and nobody cares. Uh, so you can skip all of that. Uh, she said, exploit senses and smells. Um, and then make sure you just keep everything relevant. So I think a lot of times, I know I get annoyed when I read things and I'm like, this has no payoff. Like I read all about some, I don't even know, some subplot that didn't matter, wasn't really interesting and wasn't even like carried on in the next book. So this is what she's saying in the payoff is that you need to start leaving clues now where maybe it seems like it's boring or it doesn't matter, um, but it makes a difference later. So like maybe when your sleuth is leaving from talking to a suspect or a witness, they come back to their car and they notice that the door is unlocked, but they could have swore that they locked the door, but they're like, whatever, I'm hungry, I should get home and that's it. So maybe that's a clue because someone planted something in their car. So um, that's kind of it. So don't tell, show, we've all heard that. Um, okay, this is where she talks about POV. I really just skipped over this. Uh, she basically just said the omniscient POV is kind of old fashioned. Not a lot of people use it, um, but she then went on to name two authors who do do it and do it well. Uh, and she suggested if you are a beginner to start with first or third person POV, for just one character throughout the whole book. So don't use multiple POVs in a book. Um, and then obviously the head hopping is a no-no. And if you don't know what that is, that's when you start with one person's POV and then all of a sudden you switch over to the point of view of a witness and you don't even notice that you've done that in the middle of a chapter. So that's called head hopping. I'm gonna grab a drink. <laughs> all right. You guys don't have any comments. Jess, for the titles, do you think they have to be punny? I think for cozy mysteries, uh, yes. <laughs> I think, because right away, if you have like a cute punny title that tells people right away it's a cozy mystery, and also, or you could use alliteration, right? Like, um, I don't even know who has like two, you know, alliteration, just using two of the same letters together. Like, uh, I think, who is it? I'm drawing a blank. It's an author I really like, uh, Agatha Frost. Agatha Frost uses alliteration all the time. So all of her titles, I shouldn't say all of them, but a lot of them do that. Like I think she has Cheesecake and Chaos or something out right now. So two letters. London Lovitz books, uh, Lysandra. Yeah, they do that too. Yes, great example, thanks. All right. Convincing dialogue. So again, I kind of skipped over this because I feel like you can learn dialogue anywhere from any other book. Um, this is kind of like one of those minor things that you kind of learn as you go. But Elmore Leonard, she gave an example of that. He doesn't write mysteries. However, Elmore Leonard is actually excellent at writing dialogue. If you've ever read his books, if you've seen the TV show Justified, a great dialogue in that TV show. Um, and some of it comes from his actual books. And obviously, he I think he used to consult on that show as well. So either way, this is just sort of a lot of general advice on how to write dialogue, don't use adverbs, you know, stuff like that. Um, oh, and she also used one of my favorite authors, which is Janet Ivanovich in Four to Score as an example of really great dialogue. So I think she is right. She does a really great job of that. And she said sometimes with dialogue, what you can do too to help show personality is give your character props. I thought that was a good suggestion. I did forget about that. Like how they drink something, how they eat something, how they, I don't know, hold something, how they get dressed while they're talking. So uh, you, versus just sitting and talking. So you can have them doing some other things. Uh, and then she just said, you know, make sure you summarize introductions, right? So her main takeaway from all of this is that 
I've heard people say like, you should listen to real dialogue and that's how you should write it. And I agree with her. I think that's bad advice. You should definitely not do that. It is so boring. Like when I see my friends, I'm like, hey, how are you? How was your day? Like, it's so boring, but it's like pleasantries to talk back and forth. Nobody wants to actually read that in a book. So she's saying, just summarize the introduction. I saw, you know, Jed said hi, and then we headed into the restaurant or something like that. Chapter 16, create a sense of place. So same thing, kind of generic advice, um, just make sure that you show the passing of time. I think someone who does this actually really well is Janet Ivanovich. So in her books, and I know some people complain about it, but I as a reader actually really like it. She'll just say, and then the next, so whenever she leaves off from one chapter, it was, I'm heading to bed, it was 8 p.m., I couldn't keep my eyes open. Then the next day, she doesn't start in the morning. Maybe she starts at three o'clock. She'll just say, uh, you know, I slept in this morning and then I ran down some leads, but it was three o'clock now and I still hadn't come up with anything. So then you kind of understand what time has passed and you give the reader a sense of where we are in the overall timeline of the story and where our character is at. So uh, what else should you say? Oh, drive a suspense scene, make it dark, anything that's dark or anything that's cold. So like when we were talking about seasons, I think that's why too, I don't enjoy books that are written in summer. <laughs> I don't know why. I think it's because I like, first of all, I just like the cold. So it, even though I'm wearing a tank top right now, it is so hot outside, but I'm still dreaming of like once the cold weather hits here. Uh, but I like when it's cold and I almost feel like cozy, like mysteries can't really be told in warm weather. Like that's just not fun, but that's just me. So let's get back to this. So she said also sometimes the setting can just give, uh, give you an opportunity for pacing and to give the reader a breather if you have like a lot of stuff going on. All right, now we're getting into the good stuff that is related to mystery. So chapter 17, writing investigations. So make it physical and make it verbal whenever your sleuth is interrogating somebody else. And then I think this is actually something I struggle with. She said, don't spoon feed the reader by explaining the significance of every uncovered fact. So I'm always worried if I like say something in dialogue where I'm like, oh, that was such a good catch. Like, because it's not in a movie or a TV show, I'm like, did the reader catch that? I'm just gonna tell them what my sleuth was thinking. Wow, she said that, but I think she was lying, right? Like, or this ties into the last clue. So over explaining it will make it not so fun and exciting for your reader, which she is saying, and I totally agree with. Um, and then she said, nip and tuck to avoid the monotony. Um, and then she did say, and this is good, because I always feel like I need to put everything all, like dump all the information in at once. Try to just put in little bits of clues and information that can be answered later. So don't try to, if somebody says something random like, oh, but, and then I remembered smelling almonds. And, like, don't try to discuss it or further elaborate on it. Just like let it go and leave that for something that can be discussed later. Hey, I remember, I think this is the place where he was at. It's an almond factory. And he said he remembered he smelling almonds, right? So you can leave that for later. Um, and then stay out of the future. I thought this was really good. So this is, and maybe this is me. I was saying, I, it's like my pet peeve. Whenever I see a TV show and um, who does this a lot? The, I just saw that movie, Anna, where it's like a supermodel that's an assassin. Anyways, they kept doing it. They would show some really exciting scene. And then instead of moving the plot forward, they would say five years earlier. And then you jump back to the past where I don't know why. I just don't like that. So she was saying that don't do that too. Like, don't say if I'd known what was going to happen, I never would have left her alone in that room. So like, don't jump ahead in the future. So I don't think it's just me because she did write that as advice. I think a lot of people don't like it when you time travel and jump to the future of something super exciting and then say two weeks later or five days earlier or something. Um, what's a TV show that does that a lot? Oh, Hawaii Five-0. I don't know why. They do that a lot. Not all the time, but quite a bit. Um, anyways, so mix up the clues and the red herrings. So what she is saying is you want to misguide your reader, right? So emphasize things that are unimportant and de-emphasize the real clue. Um, so maybe if the real clue is a, um, is say, I don't even know, a book, but, uh, or not a book, is the, 
is the bookmark inside a book. Just say I handed him the book. Um, the bookmark fell out the floor. I almost dropped the book. I was really worried about it, right? So all the attention then is on the book and not on the bookmark. So I think that's kind of what she was saying. I hope I'm saying that right. Um, so establish clues before the reader has context, just like smelling almonds. Like with my need to over explain, you don't have to like tell people what the significance is. You can just say it out there, leave it and move on. Um, and then also have the sleuth actually misinterpret some of the clues so that they don't really understand what they're talking about. So they mislead the reader as they're trying to like summarize what they think they heard. Um, have the clue turn out to be what isn't there. So if like uh, there was a really, she had a good example of Sherlock Holmes. Um, there was another good example actually in the TV show Monk where, you know, some woman had committed suicide and he was saying with pills, he's like, there's no way she could have committed suicide. There's no water next to the bed. Nobody would swallow a whole thing of pills without some water. So again, um, you know, the clue could be something that's not there versus, or that, that, but that should be there. Uh, and then again, draw attention elsewhere, create a time problem. Um, so put the real clue right before a fake clue. So the thing is, she was saying, people always remember the last thing that they see. So it's just like, even when I send out emails, I always put a PS usually in my emails because even if people read the whole email, they'll only remember what was in the PS. And that's just human nature. Um, camouflage a clue with an action. So you could have, you could drop a clue in, but then distract the reader with like, here's your book. And then, oh my God, there's a, there's a, I don't even know, there's an avalanche coming. <laughs> there's something, there's some sort of action that is way more exciting than the clue that was just given. Um, so she said misdirect, but don't confuse. So don't have too many, have no coincidences and don't like overwhelm them with like way too much stuff. So, you know, don't try to throw 10 different things to try to misdirect. And also never withhold information. And that, again, that was like the old way, I think, of writing. Um, so chapter 18, writing suspense. Uh, and again, there was another book I got. It was called Conflict and Suspense. I thought it would be all about suspense. It wasn't really. It was just more about conflict. It was talking about, uh, what's his name? It's the guy who writes all those Writer's Digest books, James, Jim. I don't know. I'm looking at the book. It's like way across the room, but he was just saying to use like a scene and sequel sort of uh, conclusion, but that's another book. All right. So suspense. So what she's saying is make the ordinary seem menacing. So how do you do that with those sensory details where your sleuth is hyper aware? Remember, you can make it dark, you can make it cold. Um, and you can also slow down time. We already talked about weather. Um, and then anything that covers something up like makes it look more mysterious, like a tarp or a closed door or a closed closet um, or something that doesn't seem right, like things are broken or out of place. Uh, those are ways to make uh, things seem more sus suspenseful in a scene. So how do you slow down time? So she had a couple different suggestions with complex sentences, internal dialogue, Camera close-ups, um, that's kind of all she wrote. Uh, we already talked about this. So she did say modulate the suspense, which we you already know how to, that you should do different pacing, fast, slow, to give people some sort of break in the like tension. Um, foreshadowing versus telegraphing. So I had actually never heard this term before. So foreshadowing, foreshadowing, foreshadowing um, means that you are going to misdirect. So let's say you hear something in the basement, which is dark and creepy. So the sleuth or the victim or whoever is really afraid to go into the basement. So your main character goes into the basement. They're super afraid. They have mace. They have a bat. They have a gun. Who knows what? And it turns out to be nothing. It's like a bunny rabbit or a little mouse or a cat or whatever in there making noise. So they're like, huh whatever. But you foreshadowed that the basement is super creepy and scary. And then the next time when your main character hears a noise in the basement, they're not going to be as afraid. So they just run down and then they run right into the killer. 
So you foreshadowed it by showing that scene beforehand, um, but then you've surprised them the second time around with there actually being real danger down there. So that's foreshadowing. Telegraphing is something that's way too obvious that you should actually avoid. So telegraphing is, I think this might be the killer. You look in the back seat and there is duct tape and handcuffs and like crazy stuff like that. You're like, I think this is the killer, right? So you shouldn't telegraph, that's too like Captain Obvious. Unless, of course, you're telegraphing maybe a fake false clue. Maybe he has the duct tape for because he is a electrician and he has the handcuffs because um, who knows? He had his brother is a cop and he accidentally left them in the car or something. Um, and then suspense payoff. So again, with the plot twists and everything else, it should all be worth it, right? Like at the end. But overall, she did say to read a bunch of different books that have a lot of suspense and just read how they do suspense techniques. So instead of mysteries, I think the faster way to get to how people build up suspense is to read horror movies or movies, read a movie, read a horror novel or read a thriller because um, they do it more often and they do it very well. And uh, not that mysteries don't, but you could end up reading like a longer mystery and it'll take a little longer to get to suspense, in my opinion. All right, so writing action. So she did mention that Lee Child is really great at writing action. I actually didn't know this. He used to be a TV show director and I think that's why he does it so well because he can already picture in his mind all the stuff that are going to happen. Um, so if you took, um, this is also my just note here on how to make it believable. If you took David Baldacci's masterclass, and again, he's a thriller writer, he actually, he keeps talking about how he goes on all these crazy like training things with like Navy SEALs or other people just so he can get a sense of how real it is um, for when he writes his actual scenes. So he does a lot of research and he does like shoots different guns to see how they feel and what the kickback is like. So I don't know if you need to do all of those things, but you could if you wanted. Um, oh, look at that. I have a typo stamp on the gas. There we go. Fixed. <laughs> uh, but he, anyways, Lee Child was saying use powerful action verbs, have actions and reactions. And then the most important technique, which I thought was really good, is to do a countdown. So he'll say um, the car was approaching 200 yards and now it's at 100 yards, 50 yards. So that like builds a sense of, you know, like a visual for your reader in their mind as you do that countdown. We're doing pretty good on time. We're almost there. We have like, okay, maybe not. We have like 10 more slides left. All right, chapter 20, puzzling it out, writing reflection. Um, so she, this was again, just sort of mixing in drama with your dialogue of your sidekick. So how are they going to kind of do the deduction and figure out what's going on and piece it all together? Uh, so, you know, all of this can be done to, did it again. I don't know why I can't write the word the. Um, so these should all, sometimes you could just end with a question and that will propel the story forward versus like just trying to explain everything. Like sometimes they could just come to a new question. So if she was over there, why would she be there when it was clearly on the other side of town, she said she was going home, her babysitter was about to leave, you know, it doesn't make any logical sense for her to be there. And that would propel the story forward because then it gives the sleuth and the sidekick a new area uh, that they need to investigate or a new person or something else that needs to be a new question that needs to be answered. Um, Again, we talked about this before, the sidekick, the more opposite your sidekick is from your sleuth, the better the dynamic is, or if they have different desires, like maybe the sleuth uh, really wants to solve the crime and the sidekick is the person with the car, which happens a lot in the TV show Psych. He's like, you know what? I have to get to work. I have to get to an appointment. There is uh, you know, some date that I'm trying to make it to. So they're like, hurry up because um, I need to go, right? So they have different things that they want to do. Uh, and it also adds credibility to the story. Um, and then maybe it gives them some doubt or you have a deadline, like a ticking time bomb. Chapter 21, laying in backstory. So again, this was kind of like Captain Obvious advice. I didn't really go into a lot of it. I just said you can layer it in with dialogue, memories, and flashbacks. 
Chapter 22, writing the coda. So if you don't know what the word term coda means, if you have ever, like I just know this from playing the piano. <laughs> so the coda is the, the ending, like restful sort of reflection part. So the big moment, like the big reveal, and this isn't necessarily the black moment. This is like, we found the killer, um, this is the final showdown, they've been arrested. And then the coda is like a few, I don't know, days, weeks, months after that. And they'll come back and they'll kind of uh, reflect on everything, um, clarify anything that was unanswered, uh, like some of those subplots maybe, or some like little misdirects where you're like, but I totally thought she was going to be the killer. And how was that possible? And then they'll kind of explain that in the coda. Um, so, but this is kind of like the quiet time um, and the reflection time. And it just helps clear up anything for the reader and give them a sense of what happens. So you'll notice TV shows and movies do this all the time. So even when there's like a happily ever after, um, you know, at least they'll show later on where they're like living their everyday life and everything is great and everything is wonderful. Um, you can also leave something in there, I guess if it's a series or something else where maybe like the killer got away or um, a final like a big shocker at the end where people are like, oh my God, now I'm dying to read, you know, the next book. Um, not necessarily a cliffhanger because a mystery should like be solved by the end, but something where you're like, oh, this is the next new adventure or something else, or I need to know what's going to happen. Or maybe you just leave like some crazy killer in the background that now has it out for your main, uh, your main sleuth, your main character. So that was it. All right, so now we were on part three. I know it seems like we're only halfway through, but the rest of it's pretty quick. So part three is how to revise. And again, chapter 23, flying high, fixing plot and character. So I only put things in here that maybe were related to mysteries because I feel like revision is kind of a generic thing or something that you can learn somewhere else. Um, so reread for the main plot and the character. This is her method. I was just trying to share this with you. And then, so she has three steps. So she reads the whole thing, but just for the plot and the character. And then the second time she creates a scene outline to analyze the chronology and the pacing, which I actually have never done that because I do such detailed outlines as I write. I update the outline, which I honestly would suggest that you do, especially with a mystery, because there's so much stuff going on and then you never have to refer back to it. I know it sounds crazy, but you're going to forget, like once you make it to chapter 45 or whatever, you're totally going to forget what happened in chapter three versus chapter six versus nine and when certain clues were left and everything else. So um, so I just do it as I go. Uh, and then she does a, her third step is she does a leapfrog. So she leapfrogs for the subplots to fix those up or build those up and then for the characters. Um, so that's her revision process. Chapter 24, flying low. So this one she called flying high. This is flying low. This is polishing scenes and sentences. And again, nothing like earth shattering, just sort of Captain Obvious stuff, take out adverbs pump up the dialogue, get rid of cliches, all of those things. Chapter 25, hearing criticism, finding your own fix. So she uses, I said arc, um, but she calls them advanced readers. I feel like that's the same thing. Uh, so she said to ask them to go through all of these different things. And I don't know why, for some reason in this book, she seemed really hesitant or I don't know, she had a bad experience, but she was not a fan of using developmental editors. And I think the reason why, in my opinion, is because she is traditionally published. And I think when you're a trad uh, author, you don't need to pay for a developmental editor. It almost seems like a waste of money because you already have this professional developmental editor in your publisher and your agent who is going to give you feedback on your book. So you really don't need it. So maybe you just need opinions from some other random people who maybe read a lot. So she asked them to go through all of these things. Now, I personally never use beta readers. I just use a professional developmental editor. But I think this is, you know, obviously your own choice. Um, but she was saying, if you're going to pick advanced readers, make sure not to use friends and family, make sure they're avid readers and maybe a fellow writer, and then um, have them go through all of these things. Chapter, section four, selling. So this will be really quick because this, again, was the part that was kind of outdated. So chapter 26, targeting agents. Do you need an agent? She said yes for major publishers, no for small press. 
honestly, in my opinion, I don't think small press is really even a thing anymore. I think most people, if you're going to go small press, you might as well just publish on your own because the small presses usually aren't doing print, which is really what you want. You want to see your book in print and in bookstores and because they have the distribution, but most people for small press are just doing ebook. In which case you might as well just publish your own ebook. Um, but maybe not. I don't know. There's, I think, uh, who is it? In Cozy's. Gemma Halliday has like a pretty, she's I think one of the most prolific I should say prolific, so it means she's writing, but the most, uh, she has a most wide array or expanse or variety of different writers writing under her pen. So um, let me check comments really quick. Hannah, totally bugs me when they time travel back and forth. The new Magnum PI show does that. Yeah, it's so nice. You know, I think they do that, Hannah, because Magnum PI and Hawaii Five-0, I think, are written by the same team because they do some crossover episodes. So totally with you. Also, Pan Am with Margot Robbie. Um, I've actually never seen that. Um, Stephen Wilkie, just want to say how well put together these notes are. Oh, thanks. That's so nice of you. Um, okay. Chapter 26, Targeting Agents. Already went through this. Um, so Publisher's Lunch. I don't know if you guys are in that. It's kind of weird. Publisher's Lunch, if you go to the website, you're like, was this website created in 1905? Is anyone still on here and active? Apparently they are. It has a lot of great information, which is crazy to me because they have never updated that website. But, you know, maybe it's that old adage, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And also, if you fix it, then my monthly or annual dues for membership might go up. So why bother with that? So um, that has like you can see every agent um, that is I shouldn't say every agent. Almost all agents are on there. A history of what they've sold as well as how much they've sold and who they've sold it to and for what author and what genre. So it's usually something quick like X, Y, Z sold to um, St. Martin's Press in a very good deal. And then it'll have like a dollar amount for what cons is considered a very good deal or a good deal or whatever. Um, all right. So she's also saying you can meet people at conferences and workshops and check out the acknowledgement sections of books if you want to figure out who someone's agent is. Most people just put it on their website nowadays. Um, and then make sure they're registered with the Association of Authors Representatives. Or you can get referrals from friends and writers. All right. Chapter 28 putting together a query packet. So I just left this blank because this was so outdated. It was about how to send snail mail. Um, so that's all we'll say about that. <laughs> um, so how am I using this book? So I'm really basically just using only the mystery parts of this book. Um, I think it had really great reminders on, uh, you know, what to think of when you think of mysteries and how to uh, pump up the, the, what am I trying to say? The misdirects for clues, all great things. So anything generic though about POV or anything else, I kind of just ignored. Um, not that I'm like a super expert, but just because I felt like I was really just reading this book for the mystery part. So other resources, did I even put anything? Um, stories. Oh, that's old. <laughs> Use link tree. That is an old slide. Story mistakes. Sorry. This is actually from, I rewrote this. This is from Instagram stories. So if you have this in your notes, you can delete this because <laughs> it's from the Instagram stories webinar that I did before. Um, other resources is the Melissa Storm writing and selling your cozy mystery novel, which is really my favorite um, for obviously cozy mystery writers. But I did a whole sort of review on the uh, different courses that are out there. I think there were only four and which ones I thought were the best and kind of what I thought of the others. But obviously, you know, draw your own conclusions. I know we all start from different places and we all like different things in books that we like to read or in courses. So that's kind of it. All right, Hannah. Yeah, I'd heard that if you were going to go the traditional route, it's better not to have already used a development editor because agents and editors want to know that your manuscript is good, not because of someone else who's critiquing. Yeah, I've heard that too, because then they're like, well, if you're going to use a developmental editor, that's fine, as long as they're going to do the developmental editing every time. However, I would say, you know, you never know, like as people learn and as you get better, you may not have to use a developmental editor later on. So you just never know. Um, and, you know, in theory, you are going to 
have the team of the professional traditional publishers helping you out. So it'll be just like having a developmental editor in the future anyway. Lysandra, I'm struggling to find book cover artists. Does anyone have any suggestions? You know who's amazing? Are you, Lysandra, are you doing cozy mystery book covers? Or are you doing regular mystery? Yes, cozy mystery. You know who I really love is Lou Harper. And let me find the website. Cover Affairs. I don't know, like, if you're doing, I think he does really good for, um, what do you call it? for paranormal cozies, uh, but I think just in general, he does like amazing covers. Or she, he, she, I don't know if Lou is a girl or a guy. <laughs> and probably doesn't matter, but that's the link. Jess, this was amazing. I love your new YouTube channel and you got me addicted to cozy mysteries. I'm writing my own this NaNoWriMo. Awesome, I'm so excited to hear that. We should all just switch. I should just go back to the romance channel. And just be like, let's all just abandon romance for a while. I heard too, somebody messaged me on Facebook and said that there was a rumor that um, Adobe stock is not letting you use their stock photos for romance covers anymore. I don't know what happened with that discussion or if that's still the case, but I don't even know how you would ever, ever be able to make an affordable romance cover because those covers that I made with... Um, or I didn't make them. Alana made those covers for, she did custom photo shoots. She said that those covers were $2,000 each. That seems insane to me. <laughs> like, I can't imagine, especially if you're just starting out. Lysandra, thank you. Also, I love how organized your notes are. Thanks. Hannah, this has been great. I'm currently editing my last year's novel, Nano, the first in my historical mystery series. Awesome. That's really great. So just so you know, sneak, uh, peek into next week. Where's the book? All right, just kidding. I don't know where the book is. It is somewhere in this room. I'm going to do this again next week because um, I want to write a series. So I started reading Karen Wiesner's How to Write a Fiction series. Um, so I'm going to do share all of my slide notes next Wednesday. If you want to come back here, same thing. Um, it'll multicast in theory to YouTube and I'll have it on Crowdcast. So I'll send out an email right after this if you guys want to sign up for that. So because I've taken like, I'm not going to say who, she was really nice. I had taken like, or a couple people, like two or three different classes on how to write a series and how to create a series Bible. And some of it was useful, but for the most part, I didn't really get a lot of value out of it. So um, this book was did have some Captain Obvious advice, like make sure you use the same character consistently, but it also had some other like good thought process questions and advice if you are going to be writing a series in fiction. Um, so if you guys are doing that, make sure to come back. Hannah, oh neat, I'll be there. Cool. All right, guys. Well, I hope everyone's having a fabulous day and I will see you guys next Wednesday here again for a webinar. And I'll also see you on Monday because I'm actually vlogging um, all next week too. So if you want to see my Preptober process. All right. Bye, everyone.